When a freak pasture accident ends a mare's show career, her owners discover some hard truths about their relationship. Can time heal all their wounds? Find out on this episode of Barn Stories. Welcome to the Barn Stories podcast. I'm Lori Prinz, editor of Equus Magazine. And I'm managing editor Christine Barakat. This podcast features our favorite essays and articles published in Equus over the past 40 years. Although Equus is known for articles on horse care and veterinary research, our editorial mission has always been guided by the bond that exists between horses and people. And each issue has featured a real life story that celebrates how horses enrich our lives and touch our hearts. We searched our archives, chosen the stories that resonated with our readers, and given them new life in this audio format. Longtime subscribers may recognize some of their favorite pieces. And if you're new to the Equus community, these stories will confirm that no matter what sort of saddle you sit in, a deep emotional connection to horses is something we all share. This episode of Barn Stories is a tale of transformation on many levels. When a mare named Cricket sustains an injury that threatens her show career, her owner Brenda devotes time, energy, and resources to help bring her back. But eventually Brenda recognizes that there's more at stake than simply returning to the show ring. It's a story about rediscovery. Brenda knows her horse through training and showing, but it's not until they spend time together alone that she really starts to see and understand Cricket. She mentions a specific moment of clarity, but I especially love how her perspective continues to evolve over many quiet moments, like how she noticed the small chestnut spots that trail into her sock on one leg. Another thing that makes this story so compelling is the author's honesty about her personal growth. Horses do make us better people, but sometimes the process is uncertain and even painful. With that, let's listen to Turning Point, written by Brenda Toma and read by Taylor Autumn. As I stood with the cold wind in my face, I wondered why I was in this muddy pasture, staring at a scruffy, orange, yearling filly with a pitiful wisp of a tail. I was shopping for my perfect horse, preferably a beautiful, smooth-bodied gelding. A bay would be nice, with a long, glossy tail. He would be a lovely mover and possess gentlemanly stable manners and a workmanlike attitude. So far, I had traveled many well-swept barn aisles and patted many glossy and well-muscled shoulders, but I had yet to lock eyes with the right horse. Which brought me to this rangy filly, who regarded me with cool disdain before turning back to her hay. I snapped a photo of her, almost as an afterthought, and climbed back into my vehicle. I quickly forgot about the trip as I continued the search for my next sport horse. A few months later, I was shuffling through a pile of papers on my desk when the photo of the orange filly slipped out and floated to the floor. I propped it on my desk and left it there, eyeing it warily for a few weeks. One day, I picked it up and examined it more closely. The filly had a nice, short back, a clean throat latch, and bright, calm eyes. I began to contemplate new possibilities. Several years later, I found myself trotting from the ring on my show horse, the little orange filly I had seen that cold winter day. Cricket was far from the ideal I had once envisioned, but we did have our fair share of blue ribbons on the wall. Still, our relationship was rocky. Cricket had a varying and distinct opinion on everything, from her position in the trailer, last in, first out, please, to whether she really wanted to perform a flying change when asked. In flat classes, she was a bold mover, but she also had a nasty way of swapping leads, and by her third or fourth trip into the ring of any given show, she had an even nastier way of throwing in an occasional buck. My trainer often said, when cricket is good, she is very, very good, and when she's bad, she is awful. Cricket was boarded at a show horse barn, 45 minutes from my house. She received excellent care and regular schooling. I was able to get to the barn for lessons two or three times a week, and we had settled into a pleasing routine. One day, the caller ID on my phone listed the stable name, and a breeze of foreboding crossed my mind as I let the phone ring one more time before lifting it to my ear. Cricket had taken a fall on the ice, 
as she jockeyed for position at the gate to come in from her daily turnout. We sent her to a university hospital, where diagnostic imaging showed that her pelvis had shifted and she had a deep hamstring tear. The stack of papers on my desk now deepened with bills from the various professionals called upon to treat my injured horse. Among other things, I arranged for massage therapy, deep sonar treatments, and chiropractic sessions to help return my mare to form. Yet, show weekends came and went, and Cricket showed no real improvement. Restless, I considered getting a sound, less buck-prone show horse. Summer turned to fall, and one day I walked into Cricket's stall and stood by the window. Somehow, she had managed to deposit her manure through the bars and onto the sill. I considered her obvious talents, as I took in the current condition of my show horse. She had lost weight. Her muscles were soft and her coat dull. She did not acknowledge my presence for some time until she finally turned, and her apathetic gaze fell upon mine. At that very moment, I became a better person. Suddenly, I realized the responsibility was mine. I was the one who needed to restore her. Not the show horse I had once hoped for, but the vibrant and strong soul that she had always been. At the time, I was reading to my daughter The Secret Garden, the story of a boy pampered but denied the typical joys of life because of his delicate health. His young cousin dismisses his condition and treatments, and each day wheels the boy's chair to the garden. There... His soul is nurtured by the songs of birds, the feel of grass on his bare feet, and the joy of companionship, and he is healed. I canceled all of Cricket's various therapists and massaged her daily myself. I bought her a pretty new halter with her name on the cheek piece, and every day I walked her down the concrete aisle and out into the light. Rain or shine, we would stroll outside for hours, stopping to graze wherever the grass looked particularly tasty, Often I stopped and waited while she froze and stared off at whatever it is horses see on the horizon. I studied her, getting to know her wrench-shaped blaze, which thins to a trickle and trails off down the side of her muzzle until it seems to drip from her chin. I discovered that she has a silly little cow lick on her neck and an interesting little trail of chestnut-colored spots dotting the tall white stocking on her injured leg. We walked companionably each day that fall. The songs of the birds and the feel of the grass nurtured her. The sun angled across her withers, and she too was healed. I have now moved Cricket to a barn just ten minutes from my house, and I visit her almost daily. Sometimes I just sit in her open stall door and watch the other horses in the arena while she anoints my head with alfalfa leaves. We have been learning dressage, Cricket seems to like the new challenges, and I enjoy trying to grasp the properties of an energetic and forward halt. I plan to do a few first-level classes soon. I know we will never garner high numbers in the gates category, but the beauty of dressage is that you don't really have to compete with other riders. You can compete with yourself, and a good ride is its own reward. Cricket and I now have a relationship that supersedes the highs and lows of the show world. I realize now that I had so much invested, financially, physically, and emotionally, in those 10-minute rides in the ring, that I couldn't take joy in anything other than the numbers on the judges' cards. Other show horses may come and go in my life, but Cricket will always have a good barn to live in, nice warm blankets in the winter, and fly spray in the summer. We will continue to work together on achieving our own goals in our own way. And when she is too old to ride, I will take her for long walks and wonder what she sees when she pauses to stare off into the distance. I will feed her hay, and she will feed my soul. Thanks for listening to Barn Stories. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have a favorite article or essay from the Equus Archives that you'd like us to feature in a future podcast, let us know. You can reach us at equusbarnstories, all one word, at gmail.com. Did you enjoy this episode of Barn Stories? Head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. Thanks for listening.
The Barn Stories podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network.